morning, church. Good morning. Buenos dias, familia. I promise I'm going to preach in English today, but my name is Joel Ramos. It's so great to see all of you, and I'm the Spanish campus pastor. Um, and if uh, you've been with us the last few weeks, you know that we've been talking about being happy, right? And if you can't be happy after seeing that video, nothing's going to make you happy. Seeing Pastor Chuck in a cowboy hat, I mean, that makes you smile, right? It makes me smile. It makes me all warm and fuzzy inside. But, you know, we are in uh, chapter 5 of the book of Matthew. So if you've got your Bibles, open up your Bibles to Matthew 5. If you've got your notes, pull them out. And we're, at, we're looking at uh, verse 7 today, right? And so over the last few weeks, we have been talking about the Beatitudes, being happy, being happy happy. And there are several Beatitudes and, and this incredible grouping of Beatitudes at the beginning of chapter 5 are actually an introduction to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Right? And if you've read Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, then you know that he's talking about the kingdom of heaven. Right? And, and Matthew takes great pains he, 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 in, 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 in his documentation of of this sermon, but, but he, he also takes a, a great deal of pain in documenting um, the first few chapters where, where he talks about Jesus' genealogy. Right? You see, the, the, uh, the Hebrew people, the Jewish people have been waiting for centuries for their Messiah. They've just been waiting for the promised king that would bring them happiness, that would bring them peace and joy, that would rule from David's throne forever. And they're waiting for that. They're anticipating it. Right? Matthew takes a few moments to document that genealogy. And then he tells us a little bit about Jesus' birth. Right? Kind of opening our eyes to, hey, this is the guy. He's fulfilling all these prophecies. And then we see Jesus baptized and taken, led into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit to be tested, to be tempted, and, and he comes out of the wilderness victorious, right? Comes out of the wilderness victorious, and he begins preaching and, and teaching in the synagogues and outside of the synagogues, and crowds begin to gather, and, and he, he's speaking with great authority, and he's performing miracles, and he's healing the sick, and the crowds get bigger and bigger, and then we get to chapter 5. One day, Jesus seeing that the crowd was so big, right? He walks up to the mountain and he sits down and he begins to teach. And he says, happy are the poor in spirit. Now I know what you're saying, right? Your Bible, like mine, says blessed. But if you were a Hebrew, if you were part of the chosen people of God, the Jewish nation, you were sitting there, you were standing, and you were listening, what you heard when he said blessed was happiness. And he says, happy are the poor in spirit. But they wanted to hear about the Messiah and the kingdom. Right? But Jesus knew what they needed was to be reconciled in a relationship with their creator. And he's pointing them that way. And so we study these beatitudes, these incredible grouping of, uh, of, of texts and blessings. And, and he says, well, you know, you got to be poor in spirit first, right? You got to recognize that you can't save yourself. You've got to mourn, blessed, happy are the ones that mourn. Why? Because when I recognize that I, that, you know, I can't save myself and I see God over there and I'm far from him, I cry right? at that recognition. And then he says, and blessed, happy then are the humble. My reaction to that situation is to surrender myself to him and say, Forgive me for my sins. I can't save myself. I need you to do it for me. And so we're reconciled with 
the Father, with our Creator. And then he says, blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness. So now that you are mine, right? We've accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. Now that I'm his, he says, now that you're mine, hunger and thirst for righteousness. What's righteousness? Right standing with God. That's what I live for now, right? And so we get to the next one. Today's verse. Blessed are those that show mercy. For they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the merciful. Show mercy. So we're going to talk about mercy today. We're going to talk about mercy. So in our first point, right, the, the verse kind of speaks to us. And it says, what, church? It says, be merciful. Be merciful. So what does it mean? What does this mean to be mercy, to be merciful? Well, there are a few definitions, right? We're going we're gonna to knock a couple of them out right now. The first thing to understand about mercy is, is that in its very or, or most basic form, mercy is not getting the punishment that you deserve. At the end of the day, mercy is not getting the punishment that you deserve. Instead, the punishment is withheld and God has given us what? Grace. Now, grace is getting something that I can't earn. God's forgiveness. So, first thing I want you to remember is mercy is that judgment withheld, right? Oh, and didn't and, and, and didn't Jesus deserve mercy? But they didn't give it to him, right? What did Jesus receive in place of mercy? He received the cross. He received the judgment that I deserved. That's one of the definitions for mercy. Second, you know, we've got, we've got a couple. We've got a couple that I'm going to share with you guys here. And, and so the second one, we've got mercy is also helping people that can't help themselves. Right? When you extend mercy, you're helping someone that can't help themselves. I like to think of it as love in action towards someone in need. Right? And that seems to fit this second definition. Third, a third definition that the Bible kind of illustrates for us is that mercy is building bridges for those far from God. Building bridges for those that are far away from God. How do we do that? Through gospel conversation. So, so our, 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 in our first point, point A, we are to be mercy to those that are far from God. And we find an example of that in, 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 in Matthew uh, chapter 9. If you've got your Bibles open, you can look at it. We're, 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 we're not going to read all of it. Um, Jesus, you know, I'll tell you the, the story. I'll give you the synopsis, right? So Jesus just called Matthew to be his disciple. Hey, come follow me, right? Matthew was a tax collector. The, the, the Hebrews hated the tax collectors, right? Um, considered the, 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 uh, the religious uh, people, considered them sinners, right? And you couldn't be any lower than a tax collector in, 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 their, in their eyes. But, but Jesus, one day calls Matthew and he says, hey, come on, leave that behind and follow me, right? What is God calling you from today? And Matthew immediately gets up and follows Jesus and starts living this life, right? But the first thing that he does, he's received the gift. Matthew throws a dinner party, invites all his tax collector friends to come and meet Jesus. So there's Jesus sitting with the lowest of the low. And the Pharisees and these guys, these religious guys, they, they heard about it. They, they, they see, uh, and they, how can this be? And they, and they show up to the party. They weren't invited. I don't think they were invited because I wouldn't invite them. But they show up anyway, and you know what they showed up for, right? 
They're just uh, scheming, they're just looking, they're snooping, they're backbiting a little bit. And one of them says to one of Jesus' disciples, how can this guy be eaten with these sinners? Who is he? Right? And Jesus overhears it. Jesus overhears it. And I think it's in your notes, Matthew chapter 9, verses 12 and 13. Now when he heard this, that's Jesus, he said, it is not those who are well who need a doctor but those that are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I didn't come to call the righteous, but to call the sinners. And Jesus right here is quoting Hosea chapter six, verse six, where Hosea is saying, where God is saying, I desire faithful love. So, so this would have resonated with those people in that audience. Faithful love, not sacrifice, right? The knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. And isn't that us sometimes where we just get caught up in, in the routine of going to church, right? Where we get caught up in, in the routine of sacrificing, oh, I'm such a good person because, you know, I give abundantly, I give, you know, very generously, Pastor Joel, right? We get caught up in that stuff sometimes. But what Jesus is telling us here is we need to build bridges and extend God's love, his mercy, his grace towards those that are far from him. And how do we do that? We do that through gospel conversations. And you know what speaks louder than anything you could ever say? The way you live. Live the gospel. And then when you speak the gospel, people will listen to you. So let's put ourselves, church, in the disposition to be used by God to reach those that are far from Him. Part B, right? Because it's not only to the people that are far from God, but we've also got to extend mercy to, the, to our brothers and our sisters in Christ. Right? Our brothers and our sisters in Christ. Matthew 18, 21 and 22, in your notes, then Peter approached him and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? As many as seven times? Right? And Jesus says, I tell you, not as many as seven, but how many, church? 70 times 7. And we know Peter, right? Peter's got a reputation. And, I, and, I, and I can, you can picture him, Peter being Peter. He says, you know, uh, Lord, Master, you know, how many times? 7? Now, to understand what Peter is doing, you got to put it in context, right? So Hebrew law says, you got to forgive your brothers and your sisters three times. But if they mess around and get you upset that fourth time, then it's on, right? And, and, and Peter says, okay, well, I'm with Jesus, so I'm going to double that and add one, right? Seven, right, Lord? That sounds really good, right? And Jesus says, no. Seventy times seven. What does that mean? That means we should be extending mercy without limit. And hasn't God been merciful to us? Wasn't it once that I was lost and, and now I'm found right? Why? Because, some, because God extended that mercy. I didn't deserve it. I couldn't earn it. But you gave your life for me. Right? Extending that mercy. And, and, and sometimes as a church, you know, I'm not your regular teaching pastor. I'm subbing, so I can say whatever I want right now. <laughs> but, you know, we're not always as forgiving, as loving as we should be, right? I grew up in this, right? And so I've got 40 plus years growing up in church. And I know that some people say that the church is the only army. The army of the Lord is the only army that kills its wounded. 
Now, I don't know if it's true or not, but the perception is if you mess up, you know, and if you mess up somewhere where I'm really strong, I'm really going to look down my nose at you. And how many of our young people are we hurting because we're not extending mercy to them? Right? Let's keep that in mind. And let's be merciful to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, Jesus answers every, a, a lot of these things with parables, right? He spoke with these parables because it helped people, the listeners, understand what he meant. So there's a parable that, that goes on after this question, after Jesus answers in the next few verses, and you guys can read it when, when you're at home. And, and, and it's the story about a king and, and a couple of servants, right? And um, this one servant owed the king, he was in debt, and he owed the king 10,000 talents. Now, one talent in today's money is about $600,000. Some would estimate, right? Now, and then so, so he owes the king 10,000 talents. So if you did the math, and I, I did, and I'm sure it's wrong, it's about $6 billion, right? Pastor Chuck says, okay, Joel, somewhere between uh, 400 million or 200 million and your number. I said, okay, Pastor, that, that'll, that'll fly, right? So, so he owes him a lot of money, right? He can't pay it. He can't get out of debt. So the king tells him, all right, this is what you're going to do. You're going to sell everything you got. You're going to sell your wife and your kids into slavery. And, and, and you're going to go into slavery. And everybody's going to work off this debt. And the guy starts crying. I can't do it. Forgive me. Have mercy on me. Be patient with me. And the king turns around, verse 27, I think, and forgives him. Forgives him. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? Right? The guy walks out scot-free. While he's walking, he runs into a fellow servant, not somebody that worked for him, just a fellow servant, who owed him 10,000 denarii. Now, a denarii was the equivalent of one day's wage. So he owed him 100 denarii, I'm sorry, 100 denarii, right, which is the equivalent of about $10,000 today. So he just got forgiven, let's use Chuck's number, $200 million, right, and this guy owes him 10,000. He said, give me my money. And he grabs him and he starts choking him. Where's my money? I don't have it. Where's my... Who are you going to get? <laughs> so somebody that's been observing this goes back and tells the king, this guy is choking this other guy because he owes him a little bit of money and you just forgave him. I'm not telling you what to do, but that's not right. <laughs> right? That's my version of it. So they grab, this king grabs this guy and brings him back in. They throw him in jail. You're going to work this thing off until it's all done. So he was shown mercy, but he couldn't show mercy. And what has God forgiven us? What was the burden that I couldn't pay? What was the amount, the debt that I owe for my sin? And Jesus said, I got you. I got it. I forgive you. And that day, one day, when I'm standing in front of the throne of grace. Please let me in. Jesus is going to say, I got you covered, right? Amen? Amen? Amen for that. So we thank God for his love, for his mercy, and for his grace. But that's just the first part of the verse, right? The second part of the verse is kind of my favorite part, part right? Because it says, if you show mercy, then you'll receive mercy. That's a promise. It's a promise. If I can show mercy, then I'll receive mercy. The first place that I'll receive mercy is in my affliction. In your notes, 2 Corinthians 1, 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. He comforts us in all our afflictions, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any kind of affliction through the comfort we ourselves receive from God. Now, I don't know what kind of affliction you're dealing with. I don't know. I don't know if it's, if it's health-related. 
I don't know if it's financial related. I don't know if you've got a wayward child. But chances are you're dealing with something. Right? And we know that, that Paul dealt with a lot of stuff and the beatings and jail and ultimately was killed for what he believed. And through all of that, Paul can say, I'm receiving his mercy. He's comforting me. And I can comfort you guys. And he's written us these beautiful letters that serve as comfort. God's promises for your life through your illness, through the hard times, he's there with you. Right? Now I've got these scars on my head and uh, when I was, uh, before I was even one years old, I tumbled off my parents' bed and I fell and, and I had a head injury. I know what you're thinking, oh, that explains a lot. <laughs> Calm down. <laughs> right? So a couple days later, I have these convulsions, and my brother grabs me, my older brother and my mom, and they run to the hospital, and, and I've got these blood clots in my, in my head, not even one years old yet. And immediately, they, they operate on me, and, and then there was some complications because the, the, the water in my body wouldn't circulate right, so they put these tubes in. Now, my dad is a pastor at the time, and so... He wasn't, he wasn't full-time ministry yet, but so he had to go to work during the day, and then he'd come to the hospital after work, and then he'd run out of the hospital and, and uh, drive from Jersey to, to Brooklyn, where the church was, and, 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 and be there with the church and, and, and talk to the church about God's love and God's mercy and God's grace and trust in him and believe in him. And he's got your back. Meantime, his son, who was in the hospital, might not make it, right? My first birthday was in the hospital. The nurses made my cake, sang happy birthday for me and cut it. Right? And my dad's preaching and teaching and loving on people. God is great, God is good, he's got you. And he's praying and the church is praying. And here I am, 46 years later, standing strong, right? A little healthy, but standing strong, <laughs> right? Why? Because God is great. God is, God is good. God is good. He is merciful. And the church at that moment comforted my family when they weren't sure that their little guy was going to make it, right? He received mercy in doing God's work. Part B, it's... I want you to know that we also receive mercy in our daily walk. What my dad didn't know at the time is that some 40 years later, he was going to need the care because he got sick with Alzheimer's. And then, and then slowly he evaporated, he just deteriorated. Right? And so my mother and I were taking care of him. We kept him at home. We were his caregivers. And, 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 and he forgot who we were. And then, and then he forgot how to, how to shave and, and brush his teeth. He forgot, he forgot how, to, how, to, how to eat. Right? And he forgot, he, he forgot how, to, how to take a bath. Then he forgot how to walk. Right? And we were there and taking care of him. And taking care of him. And I'm sitting here at church with you guys, and I'm like, praise God, praise Jesus. Yes. Pastor Chuck preaches a sermon, and he says, a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ contributes to God's work. Now, I heard that, and it resonated, because I was born and raised in church, but I wasn't doing anything. And so I walked up to the, to the, to the desk in the front, and I said, what do you guys need help with? And the receptionist handed me a little slip. Right? Had all these ministries and all these checkboxes. I checked them all, right? <laughs> the only one I didn't, I gotta admit, I'm not gonna lie. The only one I didn't check was like the two year old ministry, right? <laughs> it's not gonna happen. <laughs> Just not cut out for that, right? But I check all these boxes and then I get a phone call, right? From, from Miss Linda Godfrey. And she says, hey, can you meet me at church and, uh, on Sunday? And, and I meet Linda and, and, and she says, 
we want you to do uh, greeter ministry. And I was like, all right, I can do that. What do I got to do? And she goes, you see that door over there by the gym? When people walking towards it, you open it. I was like, oh, I can do that. <laughs> no problem. Anything else? And she says, smile. She says, smile, right? She doesn't know what I'm going through at home taking care of my dad throughout the week. And so I'm coming here and I'm opening the doors for you guys. And I'm smiling at all of you. Right? Some of you smiled back. Not everybody smiled back. I'm not holding any grudges, but some of you guys didn't smile back. But the ones that did smile back, and, and some of you guys would, would hug me, and you didn't know what I was going through. You had no idea. But God was touching me. God, God was ministering mercy to my soul through you. I was there to serve you, and you guys were serving me. And then at home, I was praying, and I was in my Bible, right? And I'm asking God, you know, you healed me when I was a baby, and I believe that you can still heal my dad. If it's your will, Lord, heal him, because he's still got a lot to say and a lot to do for you, right? And as I'm praying, and, I, and I'm crying, and I'm reading my Bible, God began, the Holy Spirit began to work inside of me, working on some issues that I had inside, some shame, some guilt, some things that I had hidden inside. He poured his mercy. He poured his mercy. Now, my dad died. My dad died. But I was there with him. And when he opened his eyes in heaven, I know that Jesus was there waiting for him. says, ah, you made it. Good job. Right? Isn't that what we all long to hear? And so at the end, section C right there, little <laughs> sub point C, we receive mercy on the day of judgment. Right? Ephesians 2, 4, 5 says, but God, but God, but God, who is what? Rich in mercy. That means you can't, you can't exhaust it. He's got more. God loves you more than you could ever imagine. Doesn't matter, I don't care what you've done or how far you think you, you are from him. Don't let the enemy deceive you. He is rich in mercy because of his great love that, that he had for us, made us what? Alive. Alive in Christ, even though we were dead in our transgressions. You are saved by grace. Saved by grace. So what are we doing, church? We're going to go be mercy. We're going to be mercy, and we're going to open ourselves up to receive God's mercy. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we love you. And we thank you for your goodness, for your grace, for loving us, for your mercy. Thank you, Father, for your faithfulness. It doesn't depend on who I am. It all depends on who you are. So we thank you for that. And I pray over my brothers and my sisters here, whatever they may be dealing with, that you would show yourself strong in their situations and that you would strengthen us to extend that mercy to others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.